This is Eastman's Elevated Podcast. I have on great guests that are really knowledgeable, consistently successful. We're able to dive deep down the rabbit holes of these different subject matters of shooting, of physical fitness, of mental toughness and drive. All the different skills that make up a complete hunter that you can become. Here's your host, Brian Barney. Hey, what's going on, guys? Got a brand new podcast for you. So this week we have on Abe Henderson. Um, this is actually a swap cast. So Abe Henderson, he runs a podcast, Alaska DIY. They're going to release it on their end, and then we'll release it over here on Eastman's Elevated. Um, this episode's all about hunting the hall road for caribou. So you guys know that I'm just in love with hunting the North Country with my bow and, and hunting these Alaskan caribou on the Hall Road. It's just such a good opportunity for us blue-collar guys to, to, to do our own guiding, do our own planning, and then go up there and have this adventure up in the Arctic Circle that's just worlds different than, than any of the hunting that we do here in the States. So Abe's a resident. Uh, he hunted the Hall Road with a rifle, and so... We just get together and just compare notes on the haul road. We talk about logistics. We talk about tactics, uh, what to expect, uh, different options up there. It, it's just a, a, a really good breakdown of uh, uh, how to plan and how to hunt the haul road. Um, I, I really enjoy talking to Abe. He's extremely knowledgeable. You know, I had I, – I, well, I – I talked to him through social media, and we were trying to get together, and then he ended up moving to Alaska with his family up there. And then he came into our camp up on the Hall Road and introduced himself, and so that's where we met is up there on the Hall Road. Um, but he, he's extremely driven. Uh, he, he guides hunters there in Alaska, and then when he's off in his free time, he's doing his own adventures family orientated just a good human being it's a just a, a great conversation and great recording so i really enjoyed it i sure appreciate abe being on and and i know you guys are going to enjoy it too sponsor for today's show is everly stock packs so i've been using everly stock for the last few years um, i'm just really happy with the durability of their packs i'm really happy at, at, at the way they pack weight and just the way they're designed um, they seem to have a different option. You know, everybody's an individual, what they're looking for in a pack, and they seem to have an option for everybody. So I've been using their kite pack for day hunting, little big top for shorter hunts, uh, up to five days or so. And then I'm really falling in love again with um, this, uh, the, uh, the Destroyer. Um, it's just such a great pack. It's just a... Uh, it's built burly, packs the weight really good. I'm able to take off my my top pouch and get the weight down where I want it. Uh, of course, I cut off all the extra straps I don't need and things. May have cut my waist a little tight, but that's another issue. But they just make such a great pack, and so you know I'm able to get it to the weight. It packs the the you know heavy loads and and 30 to 50 pounds just so nice and enjoyable. They they just make a really good pack. They're a great company, and we sure appreciate their support over here at Eastman's. And with that, um, I've been mentioning those Beyond the Grid episodes. Make sure you check those three new episodes that we have out. we got some um, good ones coming down the pipe, coming up. Uh, my Nevada hunt should be coming out here fairly soon, I think, um, on the Outdoor Channel there. So I need to get a date on the release of that. I think that's going to be a next-level film. Um, and, and if you're not a subscriber to Eastman's, uh, you should check out the subscription deal that we have going through the podcast right now. I mean, the subscriber stories are next level. Um, the, the staff articles, we pour our heart and soul in them. And then the MRS, Members Research Section, um, just has so much great information for Hunt in the West. Um, but you can you can get a deal through the podcast right now. Twenty nine ninety nine gets you a subscription to both magazines. Plus, uh, we'll throw in a $69.99, the, the coffee table book from all the compiled statistics from 2018. It's our MRS book. And it's a hard copy book. Um, so, you know, get that in with the deal. So what you do is you text Elevated319 to 22828, and uh, they'll set you up on the subscription. And... Um, with that, yeah, let's get into this conversation. So um, Abe Henderson of Alaska DIY, and uh, yeah, I'm on the recording, your host, Brian Barney, and Eastman's Elevated. Here we go. All 
All right, I'm here with Abe Henderson. Uh, I met Abe uh, when you used to live back in Washington, and now you've you, you've moved up, and you're you're up on in the North Country, up in Alaska. Congratulations on the move, Abe. Yeah, thanks so much, Brian. You got a good memory. Yeah, well, um, yeah, I, I remembered uh, we were going to get together for a trail run, and it just didn't quite come together um, that that one time right before you moved. And then you moved up there, and then I, I ran into you um, up hunting caribou. You just happened to stop by where we were camped this season and said hi, and you were caribou hunting at the, the same time I was. Yeah, that's right, man. I uh, I saw that your guys' camp down there, and I was actually leaving to head back. I, I think it was the third day of the season, and I had to get back in time to fly out and guide a sheep hunt. And uh, I, you guys were camped in an area that I thought was kind of like uh, blocked or like inaccessible, like you weren't supposed to camp there. Um, so I pulled in to see what the deal was, if you guys knew something that I didn't know about where you could camp in that area, mm-hmm. you know? And uh, yeah, I, lo- I, I start shaking hands and i was like wait that's brian barney <laughs> what are the odds <laughs> what are the odds it's uh the the alaskan north slope and run into each other up there yeah that's absolutely wild yeah it was cool and then you guys had some caribou hanging in camp there which i was pretty impressed by yeah that early yeah we hunt. did good um yeah it's it's just a fun trip up there it, it's just such a great blue collar adventure and i i'm such a bow nut and so to have an area like we ran into each other like up off the hall road which is a pretty popular spot to hunt caribou because you don't have to fly in you can drive so it keeps kind of the cost down and not having to buy av gas and it's it's just this blue collar adventure where you can rent a vehicle or like i have a buddy in fairbanks and then invited some friends from hawaii and so we all met up. They rented a rig, and, and uh, we met up and started hunting, and it's five miles either side uh, of the pipeline, which is either side of, of the haul road that runs all the way north from Fairbanks to, to Prudhoe Bay. It's just a, a really neat opportunity that we have to continue to to, to protect up there because it's, it's just so special for guys from the States or guys from Alaska to be able to, be able to go up and experience that. Man, it was really cool. I so I have a question for you. Have you've done a flyout caribou I have, hunt, yep. right? Most people when I talk to them, they they want to do flyout hunts. But my question for you is, like on a scale of one to ten or something like that, how do you feel that haul road hunt lands in terms of like Alaskan experience? You know, quality of the hunt kind of Man, a thing. Good question. Um, you know, like a lot of hunts, I think it's all what you make out of it. But I, that haul road for me, uh, it's it. I, I like these adventures I can afford and that I can do year after year. That av gas gets so expensive to fly in and fly your caribou out. And we did a, a big float hunt. And we were more focused on moose than caribou. But I did have a, a caribou tag and we did see some. So, I, I mean, the fly out and the remoteness of Alaska, I definitely think that you gain something there. But it seems seems like you walk a mile from that hall road or a couple miles from that thing and you're on your own you're out in the tundra and have it and i like that you're that you're mobile you're able to to move your camp and move your hunting locations uh, you know along that road to find that that caribou migration because it seems like a fly in it's either hit or miss either you put yourself right in the middle of the caribou or you're out of the migration and then you need to move or you need to float down and so that's what i like about that that hunt and that that caribou migration in and through there is it just seems like i can always find some caribou to hunt and i can do it on a blue collar budget so for me it rates really high. Like I, I've done it a couple times and I haven't even really thought about going back and flying in somewhere. I just think about going back there because they've got world-class caribou. I do think they're a little bit more switched on. Caribou have a reputation of kind of, you know, being dumb or being curious and, and definitely in that part of Alaska where they get hunted a bunch, they get switched on and they're really tuned into that tundra, picking up predators, you know, they've evolved from, you know, running from wolves in that wide open terrain for years. And I, 
I also think, you know, they get that rap due to rifle hunting where a bow hunting's a little bit different where you're really trying to get close to him. But uh, to answer your question, Abe, man, it rates really high for me. I mean, for an Alaskan experience, there's grizzly bears around, a wild river, river. You're you're in the North Slope. You really have to be responsible for your own well-being, keeping your vehicle going, you know, building camp. And, and so I, I would rate it like, you know, for me, I haven't done a lot of the stuff that you've done up there, like the sheep and the Kodiak and things. But, I mean, for me, it's like an eight or a nine. Like, I love it up there. That's cool that you say that because I kind of felt similarly about it. And um, the reason I ask is, you know, kind of mentioned I talk to folks about it. And I feel like a lot of people I talk to, it, they're thinking about their first trip and maybe their only trip to Alaska. And I think the fact that it's a road hunt in their mind takes away from the experience. Like it's it wouldn't be as cool. Or you're not seeing, you know, a, a, a good part of Alaska because it's road accessible or something like that. In my experience, this this summer was my first trip up there, um, and uh, I thought it was fantastic. And I like you said, you hike a mile or two off that haul road, and I didn't see anybody the entire time I was there. I was there for like four day, five days total, and only three days were, you know, of hunting after the season opened. Um, so I went up there up there a little bit early to hike around, and. I had a great time, man. Didn't see anybody. Got to drive the haul road from, you know, north slope of the Brooks Range all the way up to Prudhoe Bay and back, just exploring. And um, got into mountains, got into flat tundra across the river several times, crossing the sag there. And I just, I had a blast. You know, went up solo, went up by myself. But uh, definitely want to encourage folks that want to do Alaska. Like you said, you can do it for cheap. You know, it's definitely a blue-collar hunt. Yeah, but it was a high quality experience for me. Yeah, good. I'm glad to hear you had the same experience. Yeah, it um, maybe the vehicles turns people off a little bit of the hunt, but it it is an amazing experience, like you say, to go over Adigan Pass and drive through that Brooks, and it's so pristine and so clean and um you know there, there there's a highway running through there and there is you know work being done and people traveling that highway but there there's just not a ton of traffic or a ton of people out there and and like you say you cross that river you got it all to yourself or you climb up over the top of one of those mountain passes you know and you you've got the muskeg in there and so it makes it tough to walk around and so you know, it just doesn't seem like guys are putting in a ton of effort, or maybe there's just so much country and it's so vast that you can really get away from people and have your own experience there. Yeah, totally. You know, there's pros and cons to it being on the road, and I, I've done a lot as a guide. You know, I do a lot of flyout hunts, and that's kind of the standard actually for a lot of what I do. And when you're dropped off, that's where you are, and <laughs> you're hiking from there. It was so cool to go up there, have a vehicle, and have, I don't know what it was, 100 miles of road or something like that north of the Brooks Range. And uh, if I didn't like the area I was in, and I did this a couple of times, I just hauled back to the van, jumped in, took off, and went and found a new spot, hiked back in again. And that sense of freedom and flexibility was really cool. Yeah, you don't feel like you're trapped. That's the advantage that I see to it, too, is just being able to be mobile. You're, you're able to find the caribou and then you know move your camp to where you're close to them and, and then really hike out and get your experience. But, yeah, it does allow you to, to, to be mobile and to find the pulse of caribou and, and to change your, your game plan. If you're not seeing anything that day, you don't have to sit there for eight or ten hours and watch a – watch a, a blank hillside with no caribou on it you know you can get in and and, and move 10 miles you know up the river or down the river and and find a pulse of caribou in your hunting again so that definitely is one of the advantages yeah hey tell me about your shooting your bull this year yeah so um Gosh, I took it down to the end. So my buddies, um, they capitalized in the beginning. We had a really good pulse of caribou that were moving all through there. And we got on a couple really nice bulls, and they were able to harvest a couple nice bulls. And, and so, you know, taking care of those bulls and getting all the meat taken care of and getting things back to camp. And, and then it started to peter out a little bit after that. You know, it's um, you're finding less and less caribou per day. And so we were just mobile, and uh, we found some good vantage points that were kind of looking over country that that nobody else was looking or nobody else was hunting we also looking across on the other side of the river like you did looking to cross that river get on the other side and chase them around and so i, I just hunted hard i got i got opportunities for a stock every single day and and um 
on some world class caribou too. I gosh, this one bull I got close to that I snuck up in his bed, and I could have shot the two medium bulls, but the big one just was feeding across, and gosh, he had to have forty or fifty points. I I always yeah, I really? mean just uh um you, you know I I'm not sure a score on inches, but just a giant caribou with points going everywhere, just a really good looking bull, and I I had him really close and played the game inside bow range, but I I got opportunities every day, and finally. <sighs> I was getting down there on days. You have so many so many travel days coming from Montana, flying up, and then getting to Fairbanks, and then having to fill up, get groceries, and drive up the Hall Road, and then drive back from the Hall Road, take care of the caribou, and hop on a plane. So there's a few days of logistics there, and so I was getting down to the end of my days. And, um, yeah, I just, um, you know, went to this master vantage point that I had done good on and uh, able to spot um, some caribou bulls up there. There was one pretty decent bull with some good palmation and definitely a shooter for me. And he was with a younger bull, and they were just feeding in the river bottom down there in like a like an empty channel. And so um, made a play down on them and, and started getting down in there and then couldn't find them. And they had actually bedded in that river channel. So the closer I got, kept exposing a little bit of country and a little bit of country. And finally, I could see the tips of his antlers, and he was bedded right there in, in, in one of the last places I had seen seen him and um so i just crawled in it was kind of a a rainstorm raining and kind of making a little noise and i was able to to crawl up and get in the brush and get to my knees and get set get to a really good um comfortable range for for archery and then just wait for him to stand and the younger bull got up and started feeding around he looked at me for a little bit but i was just kneeling in the grass and not moving and 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 pretty camoed in and so uh, he didn't pick me up back to feeding and finally that bull stood up and put a perfect arrow in him and and he didn't go far and and uh died right there and i had a good buddy with me and and um yeah we were actually able to capture it on film it's on like the eastman's beyond the grid right now the the hunt up the hall road um but just a really cool experience and to be able to end it like that in my last day or two up there and put a perfect arrow in a bowl like that man it's just so awesome that's cool yeah i'm gonna have to check that out i didn't see that episode um you said something in there though that after having been up there i know is pretty key for a bow hunter though and you mentioned being in the brush yeah like talk about talk about the advantage of finding brush or hunting caribou in, in brush country versus out on the open tundra yeah that is right you have to pick and choose your stocks with these caribou they you know they are so well suited for that open tundra and they you know they're used to like i talked about earlier they're used to avoiding wolves and so you know they can't run 10 miles away from a wolf when they see it they just run a couple hundred yards away and then keep an eye on it but they have really good eyesight and like i say i think these caribou on this hall road get hunted more and any animal that gets more pressure is more switched on more in tune with hunting pressure more in tune with predators and so you know they're pretty wary for a caribou and so in that open country um, you know, sometimes you see a caribou and it's a bull you want to kill, but there's just no play to make. There's no topography. There's no brush. And so you're right. When you can catch them in those river bottoms and have some brush or some contour to the land, it, it turns into a high percentage play to go down there and try to make something happen. And, and then you just rely upon your instincts to kind of keep yourself hidden, not expose yourself and, and, and be able to move up. But, you know, I, I get a lot of plays in that open country, too. It's amazing how much topography is out there once you get out there and sometimes you can't tell from afar but a little rise will get you a long ways on a stock and I, I just try to never stalk recklessly and so I never give myself away if I if I know that caribou is going to see me I won't make that move uh, if I know I can get away with it or if I can crouch down and be hidden from this caribou then I'll keep moving in and so I kind of take what they give me but I, I'm not afraid of that open tundra either. Did you get after it and get close on some of that open? Yeah, absolutely. Stuff? Yep. Yeah, oh, that's cool. Yeah, when I was out there, so I took a rifle up, which, you know, I just hadn't practiced with my bow. We just moved up and we're really in transition, and I just, I just didn't feel really comfortable taking my bow because I hadn't spent time with it. So I took my rifle up, and so, you know, for for people who don't know, there's a five mile corridor on on each side of the pipeline, and if you're hunting with a rifle, you have to hike outside of that five miles um before you can actually hunt so i did that 
And th- of course, that put me away from the river channel and, and all the cuts and braids and, and the brush down there. Um, so it's not as big of a deal with a rifle. You can obviously shoot a lot farther and stuff. But it just felt like I was like way out in the wide open plains, like just it was it kind of had a barren feeling to it, you know, just being a few miles out on the tundra. And even though it was sopping wet, everything was wet, but there was very little cover in, in the areas that I was at. Um, and I was just thinking like, man, this would be tough if you were bow hunting. Like I could see the advantage of hunting, hunting the, uh, the cut, the river cuts and the river channel and the brush and, and more, more geography there to play with more topography, you know, more cuts and, and banks and, and, you know, those braids actually kind of hump up, you know, get gravel bars and stuff like that. I could imagine that'd be pretty good. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that's part of the deal up there that you have to learn is that, uh, and this is my second year heading up there to hunt in that spot in there, you know, hunting that haul road, but it is something that you have to learn with all species and in all different habitats, you have to kind of pick and choose your stocks. And sometimes it's a giant bull that you really want to kill, but there's just no play to make. And so you're forced to, to either sit and watch or, you know, to move around, to wait, to check on them the next day. But you can't just go for every one you see. You, you, you really have to pick and choose the high opportunity plays that give you a chance to get in. Or otherwise you end up chasing your tail and, you know, spooking caribou across the tundra, never getting close and wasting all that valuable time and, and effort, you know, for nothing. Nothing, you know, for for a failed stock from the beginning. So it is about picking and choosing which caribou you go after. And in that open tundra, it can be tough, man. It's wide open and flat in a lot of places. Yeah. The other thing, I don't know. Uh, I didn't explore much in the area that you guys were hunting generally, but um, I would go out and I would see what looked like a hill. And I'd hike up on the hill thinking I'd have a vantage point to where I could glass from um, and see more country. And it had this weird rolling like effect where there wasn't even though i was going up i thought it was like like i could tell from a distance i was on a hill or a slope of some kind but it was like i wasn't gaining elevation or i wasn't getting like relief where i could look down did you do you know what i'm talking about like the 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 tundra seems to keep rolling away from you like you're trying to look at the curvature of the earth almost you know yes that can be a little tough but you know there's all different terrain throughout that hall road all the way from the mountains where you come over at again all the way you know to the to the flats down by prudo you know and so there's just different topography out there but yes i have ran into that in 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 some of that that country that you're talking about down there where I try to walk where I'm going to be able to see more and I get there and I can't see more. And so then I just keep walking yeah. <laughs> and it's like I'm trying to glass around the curvature of the earth or something. So I understand completely what you're saying, but there there are some good vantage points all the way through there. It's just looking for those high points and then hiking to them. But I know exactly what you're talking about. Roger. Yeah, that was weird. Did you get a bull last year on your first trip? I did, up there? Yep. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. What was the learning curve like for you, like your first time up there? Did you adapt pretty quickly to it, or or was it? Did it take a few days to kind of get the hang of, of what yeah, was going did. on? Like trying to get in tune with uh, caribou's behavior and and uh, kind of their tendencies, and then getting used to the country. And it 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 is just thrown into this new experience in there, but. I'm such a bow hunting freak and I spend so much of my time and it's all spot and stock that a lot of those skills transfer over. And so, you know, I made some mistakes and there was definitely some learning curve there, but ultimately it's, it's spot and stock bow hunting in open country, which I'm really familiar with. So it was just getting used to some of their, their tendencies, some of their habits, getting good at picking them out, finding the country that they preferred. Uh, again, learning that high percentage, low percentage on the caribou. There was a, a couple empty stocks out there where I'd put a lot of effort through the tundra just to get out there to find that there really was no play. And I wasted an entire day, you know, trying to get close to an impossible caribou. So, you know, that, that was a learning curve. Also, those caribou, um, man, they, they're they're just wanders they just they'll they'll wander one direction for a while and then they'll run off the other way you know bugs can play a role but they they're a 
they're they're a real nomadic animal. I mean, they're a migrating animal, but they just don't keep going in one direction. So you'll see a bull working one direction and think, well, I can get in front of him and cut him off. You spend all this effort and get out there in front of him to cut him off, and he's turned around and gone the opposite direction without even seeing you. So I guess it just took a little while to get in tune with it, but I adapted pretty quick just transferring over open country bow hunting skills to those caribou. Yeah, gotcha. Gotcha. That's interesting. If I was going to go up again and I thought about going up again, I'm definitely taking a bow. Um, the cha- the just, you know, for me, time is really limited a lot of times. And, and the reason I chose that hunt is because it does open August 1st. And so I could sneak in a few days of hunting before I have to fly out for sheep season. Um, but like, having to hike that five miles off the road, like you said, eats up time and time is really critical up there. Even though you have tons of daylight, um, you got to sleep sometime. And, and it seems like a lot of times when you're hunting in general, it comes down to how much time you have blocked off that you can actually put in and, and, you know, kind of keep after it to try to make something yeah, happen. I, I'm impressed that, that five miles from that, that hall road or from that pipeline, Man, that's a pole out there, and and I love to hunt that remote country. But you're right; it takes so much time and so much effort, and and the the muskeg just exaggerates all that. So it's not like five miles, you know, out on your local highway or you know out on the the prairie where you're just cruising country, where five miles goes by pretty quick. That's five miles of of, of slogging effort out there, you know. And that that muskeg, and I'm sure your audience knows, but but some of my audience, like um, that muskeg, it's these these mounds uh, of of grass and that stick up out of the water and so there's all these mounds but they're really soft and so when you step on them your your ankles and your legs bend so it takes every muscle in your leg to stabilize yourself and you kind of try to solve the puzzle uh do i hike the muskeg and step in the bottoms do i step on the tops of the hills (laughs) nothing works nothing is a good path through there it just takes a lot of effort i did find that the trekking poles kind of helped to stabilize my legs more where i could do you know if i had to do long miles the trekking poles really seemed to help because it just stabilized myself where I wasn't trying to balance all the time but that balancing on each one of those the those mounds of muskeg it it it's so much exertion it it it's so much effort goes into covering miles so that five miles that you had to cover before you could start hunting like like that's big effort and big time to get back that far and then there's no guarantee that there's caribou there and if you have to move locations you know you're another five miles out five miles back in so you're racking up a lot of miles in that muskeg real quick so yeah i don't blame you i i do think that bow is a huge advantage being able to you know use that 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 road and find different vantage points being able to move and then get stocks throughout the day so i hear you yeah i think i did that five mile round trip about three different times um i one i did go play around in the mountains though on the north on the north slope there i got a tip that uh uh from a trucker that has hunted that before and had good success but i didn't find any caribou i found tons of sheds sheds like hundreds of sheds which was really cool and beautiful mountain valleys i mean just like postcard quality you know landscape um but that was much easier walking because you could walk stream beds and you could walk ridges and get out of that tundra a little bit um but then i did definitely do some hiking you know on the coastal plain there and that 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 stuff is rough. You're not, you're not exaggerating. Um, and people like when I went up there, I'd heard people talk about walking on it and I'd never been this, this last year was the first year I'd been north of the Brooks range and been up, um, in the Arctic. And, um, it is seriously physically and mentally challenging just walking on flat landscape. Because like you said, it just every muscle in your body, like it takes so much effort just to walk a short distance and through that stuff. Um, but I, I actually went out and, tent camped on it and that was that was kind of an interesting experience so i spent a couple of nights out on that tundra and and um what i did was i took i bought an alpaca raft this year um because i was looking at caribou hunts brian and i was looking at like the cheapest um air taxi that i could find was like 2500 bucks to drop you off and pick you back up again for a caribou hunt and uh i looked at those pack rafts and i was like man for like 1500 bucks i could use it every year you know, and save some money and do the haul road hunt. And there's some there's some ways you could actually put in uh, and do a float hunt 
and and pull out back on the road if you know you get creative. But uh, I ended up pitching a tent. I would deflate it on the tundra, lay it out flat, and pitch a one man tent on top of it so that I could sleep on all that water and mush and <laughs> that that knobby grass. And it actually worked okay. But uh, yeah, the things you learn out there and the challenges. Uh, that you face in like a new and completely different landscape. I mean, it definitely took me a few days to get kind of comfortable with moving around out there and 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 figuring out how to just kind of exist out there, much less uh, much less hunt. Yeah, it takes a little bit. Uh, that's that's real invade. Uh, uh, it, that's a really good thinking to set up your raft like that because it would be tough to get a tent set up like on that that uneven terrain. Like there isn't a flat spot anywhere. It, it's all this muskeg marsh. It's all wet. Like you say, uh, yeah, good on you figuring it out with that pack raft in the tent. That sounds like a pretty slick setup for staying out, on, uh, uh, you know, out on the muskeg. And it's it's light for so long that you can hunt for so long, which is another advantage. Is like uh, another advantage of it is that there's just so many different angles up there, and there's definitely guys that hunt it. It's you know one of the only accesses for not one of the only, but it it it's a great adva- advantage for for locals there in Alaska where they don't have to fly out because it does cost so much. So there are hunters there, and so you do deal with some hunting pressure. Most everybody is really good and considerate, and like I say, you get a mile in that muskeg, you get away from everybody. Um, but there too, you know, it, it's light so long, and everybody comes back to dinner and back to camp at eight o'clock at night, and they're done hunting for the day. But it's light throughout the night. You can hunt dang near twenty-two hours or twenty-four hours, and so, you know, we would do really well too. Is you know having dinner and then you know going out and in in the dark of night, and there's nobody there at ten o'clock at night, nobody hunting, and, and so you'd get up on these vantage points, and that's where you'd see a pulse of caribou coming through, you know, and 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 be able to take advantage of it and get on them, and so. Um, uh, we did a lot of that playing around with times that we hunt too, um, with the light up there. And, and also you don't want to, uh, you, exhaust yourself up there either. The, you know, sleep deprivation is a form of torture in the military. And so you got to be careful that you're not redlining too far and you are catching some sleep. Um, so, so that took a little getting used to too, but yeah, there's so many different corks to that hunt that I, I really enjoy it. Did you guys see anything other than caribou up there? I mean, obviously, you saw muskox. Um, they seem to be pretty ubiquitous, like throughout that whole Arctic North Slope area. Um, but did you see like any grizzly bears or wolves? Yeah, or yeah, we saw a um, couple grizzly bears this year. Um, I think I only saw one, but I think between our crew, we maybe saw three of them or so. And then the year before, I had seen some grizzly bears up there too. Okay, cool. Did you guys have any close encounters with nope. them at all? Oh, that's good. <laughs> I bumped into one in the mountains when I was up there hiking, and I was it was kind of in a steep little uh, narrow valley, and so and I wanted to go, you know, he was kind of in the way of the, the direction I want I was hiking, and I thought about going around him, uh, but I spent so much time around bears like down on Kodiak Island and stuff, I I knew I could just drop down into the valley instead of, instead of going like a big route across the ridge and stuff like that. So I just kind of went for it and I walked by him at a couple hundred yards, no big deal. And, um, and <laughs> he saw me walking and would go back to feeding and then I get a little bit closer and he'd look at me, you know, I was kind of keeping an eye on him and I was kind of filming him with my cell phone as I walked by. And then all of a sudden he picked up his head and started like walking towards me. <laughs> and I was like, Oh man, this, this isn't good. Um, so I kind of hurried up to get down. There was, it was daytime, you know, so there was a thermal going up the valley. And so I kind of hurried downhill so that he would uh, get my wind faster. Well, that put him at like an elevated position, um, which made me even more uncomfortable when he, even after he got my wind, he was still walking towards me. And um, I ended up having to shoot at him to scare him off. Uh and the last shot, I shot at him three times, and the last shot was at like forty oh, yards. Wow. He just walked, kept, yeah. He just kept walking straight at me, looking at me, and he would drop his head and kind of sway side to side as he walked. And he was just a little scrappy runt of a bear. He wasn't a big grizzly at, at all. Um, but man, I, he had no manners. That's for sure. <laughs> like I was just like just trying to walk past him, and and he wanted to come check me out, and and I don't know what he had in mind, but I wasn't. 
I wasn't excited to find out. Man, I'd say, yeah, uh, you're so familiar and comfortable around bears, yeah. In uh, that scenario, I would have probably done the same thing. I've been around a ton of grizzly bears and um, haven't had that many issues. But it sounds like maybe that's that young, curious boar that just sees you and wants to come check you out. But that would have made me a little nervous, too, when he keeps coming and gets into about 40 yards and, and doesn't run off from the first couple gunshots. Um but, yeah, exactly. you know, and if it would have been a handful of days later, you probably could have been hunting grizzly up there. But it sounds like it was a, a run of a bear. But they do have some fairly decent size inland grizzly bears there. I, I've been impressed with some of the size that I've seen on some of those boars. Yep. Have you? That's cool. Uh um, have you hunted in the mountains there at all? Yes. Like last year? Yeah, last I year? really enjoy those mountains. So you had stated earlier they're easier to get around. There's also a lot of topography. And so, yeah, I, I love getting on those ridge lines and being able to cruise or up those those, those river bottoms, the, the channels in and down through there. But, yeah, I really like hunting the mountains. Um, probably one of my favorite spots to hunt in and through there. And, and you can just – cruise country and get a whole new vantage that you can't see from the road you know fairly quick and there there's just really good ridge lines that you can work that that those caribou migrate and pulse through and yeah i think you found all those sheds they so the caribou down there and, and you're probably aware of this but they they migrate like opposite of what i would think about as like elk in the mountains so in the winter time they migrate to the Brooks Range, to the mountains, to feed off the wind-blown slopes there. Um, and then in the summertime, they go back down and in, into those coastal plains um, down below and live and eat off all that, all the the grasses and and uh, things that are down there off that that coastal plain. But yeah, they they migrate opposite. So they go to the mountains for the winter time, and then you know down to that that tundra for the summertime um so they were probably hanging up there when they shed their horns uh in the winter time or um you know in that 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 late winter early spring so i'd imagine that's why you found a bunch of sheds there but yeah i love hunting those mountains yeah isn't that fascinating that you know like coming up from the lower 48 i'm so kind of ingrained in the mule deer and elk migration where they summer in the mountains and then you know come down out of push get pushed down by snow and 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 they come down to breed and stuff to rut down low and you know winter in the rolling sagebrush and stuff but uh yeah i was fascinated by the fact that the caribou they winter up high yeah it's wild but the, the, that mountain those mountain that mountain terrain offers a lot of topography for bow hunting. It, it's just a great place to bow hunt those things. But it is wide open terrain and in a, a little bit, I, I think it could be overwhelming for guys. Like you say, it doesn't look like it's the most conducive bow hunting out there as a lot of it is wide open. But you, you just got to look for the topography, look for the folds, look for the low spots or the channels or down in the river down there. But just trying to use every advantage as you can. But it is it, wide open terrain. There isn't a, a tree out there after you go over Attigan Pass. Yep, not a bit, and that was such a fun thing for a spot and stock hunter. It's like the pros and cons of it is you, you, there's less cover, but man, you can see so much country. You know, everywhere you go, you're just looking at what's there. You can glass really effectively, and you're not looking for critters that are laid up under a tree or in the brush or something like that. Yeah, and as a as a bow hunter. I always like open terrain. I just, if I can see them, I feel like I can kill them. It's, it's that thick stuff that kind of gives me fits or, or when they disappear into cover. So I really like the open terrain for bow hunting. And it, it kind of reminds me, my joke is, um, it reminds me of antelope hunting out west because it's wide open prairies, um, you know, versus wide open tundra. And in the antelope, they have some of the, the, some of the same behavior as caribou, just um, their curious nature and then also the, their nomadic nature as they really wander and they change their mind easy and you can't really predict what they're going to do. But I always say those caribou up on that, that haul road, it's like hunting a, a, an antelope with 400-inch horns. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, so this year when we met, we were at the very beginning of the season. We were up there at the same time. So I think it was must have been like August 3rd or something like that when we met. And the season opens on the 1st. Um, the, the first time that you went up there, did you hunt the same time of year? Or did, were you up there at a different time? I think the, the first time I went up um, – I think I was just a hair later. Like I think I – 
went up there like maybe August 6th or August 10th or right in there towards the, the maybe the second week of the season or something like that was my first trip. And then this time I went on opening weekend. And so there's advantages and disadvantages, but just like the, you know, timing your hunt, um, you know, for pressure, it's – it's also timing your hunt up there for those caribou pulses that come through. And so timing can be a big deal. It can be red hot on fire caribou everywhere. Um, you know, and, and then just as quick as they show up, they can disappear and it feels like there's nothing in your area. So there's kind of pulses that come through, but I, I think that if you the later it gets in the season, you know the closer they get to the mountains. Um, but but there too, it seems like they're spread out all the way from the mountains all the way to Prudhoe Bay in different little pulses in and through there. But but I do think as it gets later in the season, and I believe they rut in like September up there, um, and, and kind of move more towards the mountains. Um, but but just fun to hit those migrations and and timing wise. Yeah, I'm not sure what the ba- best dates are um, as far as catching those things. I, yeah, I, I, the the jury's still out for me on the best timing up there. Yeah, um, I was just curious if you had seen any difference. I guess one week difference might not make um, make a big change. There's probably more variability just year to year. Um, but we were definitely there during bug season. And I know you like when I pulled up, you guys had a thermocell right there in the middle of your your uh, camp chairs running, and uh, that was definitely kind of an interesting thing to to you know acclimate to was living under a, a bug net and and all that kind of all the challenges with that, especially with camping and stuff like that. But uh, what did you guys find? What was your experience with bugs? Yeah, they are gnarly up there. You know, I. Every hunt has its challenges, and and it doesn't really take away from my experience up there. But they do get thick, and 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 it's sometimes almost overwhelming. But you, you just kind of you you figure out your system up there, and so you know you, I I don't use you know I don't like putting deed on my skin or on my clothes. But up there, I figure for seven eight days, um, you know it, it's probably healthier than getting a couple hundred bites on me because they they do just attack you up there, and and um. So yeah, the the DEET seems to keep them off. The thermocells, those things seem to work pretty good, and so it doesn't really take away from the experience. You know, sometimes you just laugh when you're absolutely covered up in those things. And I do have a head net for when it gets really bad, but I tend not to wear the head net too often. I'll kind of wear a face mask uh, with a little DEET on it or whatever. But um, they can get thick and really gnarly up there. And I actually have found that the white socks, I'm not sure what you call them, but it's like a little gnat that they can actually be worse. Yeah. Um, you know, they're a biting little gnat that they don't seem to mind the deet and they swarm really thick. Like when you, you know, when you kill a caribou, they swarm really thick, but they, they're just always crawling in your nose and in your eyes and in your mouth. And <laughs> they, they're just so thick, but you know, I, it, it's just kind of part of the experience up there, and it doesn't really take away from me having fun. Like you just bug net up or you deed up, and then you know you you try to get uh, you know with a little bit of wind on those ridges is always nice, um, and, and just kind of deal with them. But this year there was no white socks, just uh, uh, mosquitoes. In some of the days it was cold enough where we didn't have any mosquitoes. The cutoff seems to be about 42, 41 degrees. And, and 42, 43, they're all out. 41 degrees, there's not a mosquito out. It's really wild, the cutoff. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's kind of a similar experience for me, but like trying to eat and trying to use the bathroom. Like that was always the challenge, you know, like getting swarmed by mosquitoes. But uh, I went up to the mountains. I kind of had – was running around kind of ADHD style. Just had a few days, and I wanted to see so much of that country. So I was just constantly like driving back and forth and hiking around, uh, which is probably not the most effective way to hunt. Um, but I was kind of thinking I might get up in those mountains and get away from bugs and I don't think I was high enough because I definitely experienced a lot of bug pressure. The hiking was a lot easier and the, the scenery was gorgeous. Um, but uh, but I didn't get away from the bugs up there. But a biologist had told me that uh, you can kind of get I – think, I think you have to get up in the, like, the snowpack still to where she said that uh, you can go up there and find bulls hanging up high in the mountains that kind of become residents and they never leave. Have you heard that before? Have you experienced that? Oh, that's that? wild. Um 
No, but it makes sense. Um, some of those bulls would just find places that they like to be or valleys that they like to be with plenty of food and not getting bothered. And those those bugs, they're definitely a nuisance on those caribou. In fact, some some people or some guys um, believe that the bugs make for better hunting up there. That they annoy those caribou and keep them on their feet and keep them moving and keep them migrating. So you know he doesn't like hunting when there are no bugs. He likes to hunt when the bugs are the thickest because he thinks it it keeps those caribou moving. But yeah, that's that's interesting that there would there would be bulls that would just find a, a a good little spot in the mountains and then just hang out there. I mean, why not? They don't need to come down to breed. You know, the the breeding season's way later in September and they have everything they need up there and they get away from the bugs a little bit. It makes sense. I think I'd be one of those bulls. I know, right? Yeah. So I guess, you know, you get on those those snow packed areas and it keeps that temperature down and, and they get relief from the bugs and a little more wind in the mountains. But uh I didn't get I didn't spend enough time. I didn't find any up there. I think I was I wasn't high enough elevation because I wasn't in snow really. Um but uh that if I go back I think that would be a fun thing to try to explore. Uh, try to find a bull up high, kind of like sheep country. Yeah, I, they're in those mountains. I really like hunting those mountains, those steep ones. I like glassing them, and, and I have turned up bulls in there. And it, it doesn't seem like you find the big caribou pulse, at least when I've been up there the beginning of August. I don't find the giant pulse, but I'll find little bachelor crews of bulls up there. Like, oh, my gosh, there's five bulls there. Or there's three bulls there. And uh, some really good yeah. ones and living in that mountain terrain. And so, yeah, I really like hunting those mountains. And I, I it, it makes for such a good experience. The scenery is so beautiful up there. So, yeah, I like that spot. There, there's a bunch of really cool locations like where the Rib Dawn comes in. You know, Slope Mountain's really cool. Uh, the foothills going up through. And then uh, the Brooks Range up top. And then, you know, I even like a lot of that country as you get down towards Prudhoe Bay where, you know, is where I ran into you this year. And what I found too, I've only been up two years, but everything changes year to year. It just seems like I find the bulls in a different area. They're doing different habits. They're just in a different place in their migration. And so it, it was drastically different from the first year to the second year, but it's almost like you just kind of adapt on the fly. And, you know, first off you got to find caribou. And then once you find caribou, then you can start to dissect that landscape and get to the those vantage points and find them but i really like to find the pulse of caribou and then start hunting them and getting in deeper and dissecting the land even further but that's kind of been my method of operation for hunting up there yeah that's smart you know that's smart um what kind of numbers of caribou were you seeing you know you said you saw small groups in the mountains, but when you call it a pulse or whatever, what kind of numbers are you seeing, Brian? Yeah, well, it it all differs. It differs, but when when I say a pulse, like it's almost like there there's there's a migration of caribou around. Like there's there's a, a thousand or a couple thousand caribou moving through in different groups, and you might find a a group of fifty, or you might find a a group of twelve. I mean, there was groups of twenty caribou that we'd find that were twenty bulls, and they were all all giants moving through and so when i say a pulse like i i'm looking for the migration i'm, I'm looking for a mass of caribou and now you might not see that whole mass but all of a sudden you're picking out oh there's a group there's a single there's there's four over there there's six over on that skyline so you're just seeing caribou kind of all around you and then like as you pay attention and start to hunt them more they're moving and migrating through using the river system or using the ridge lines and so it just seems like once you can get into a population of caribou or or a pulse like there there's just there's more caribou coming you know you'll you'll be looking at a few and you go oh there's 10 more they're down on the river they're headed our way or now i see 50 more down on the river down there and so when you when you get into a pulse of them it's just trying to find like this this migration these numbers and then from there that you just start finding caribou everywhere because you're into them then it seems like yeah, no, that's cool. That's kind of the idea that I had when I went up there was I did a lot of, like I said, driving and glassing and hiking, um, checking out different areas to look for them. And I honestly, in the amount of time that I was there, didn't really get into big numbers of caribou. I would see smaller groups here and there. Uh, but I never felt like I nailed, uh, you know, a decent a part of the migration. Um, so that was a little bit disappointing for me. But um, all in all, man, I mean – the whole trip was such a cool experience, and I feel like, you know, the the tundra, and the bugs, 
and just learning that topography and like all those challenges for me. Um, I've never really hunted pronghorn on, on open plains. And I, you know, if I ever was doing any hunting back home or, you know, up here, it seems like it's always based around mountains. So for me, like it was a very different experience. And I think that a lot of people maybe back in the lower 48 who do a lot of mule deer hunting or antelope hunting or whatever, you know, that they're, they're more accustomed to kind of that rolling country or kind of, uh, foothills kind of country and stuff like that but uh it was it was really cool i don't know i just enjoyed the um the diversity from the mountains north to the coastal plain of of terrain and getting getting having the flexibility of being able to drive back and forth and pick your spot and just get out and hike like that whole thing was uh was really cool for a hunt in alaska because that's not often the case you know like we were discussing before but then combine that with seeing muskox every day you know i saw um peregrine falcons up there on the river system um flying around that was really cool um and then just seeing caribou and just being in a place that feels like kind of almost otherworldly like the lighting is different you know i don't know if you know what i'm talking about but it's like the whole place just has a different feel to it. Man, it sure does. Uh, it it does. Like, the clouds seem closer. Like, it's just got a different feel. It is so far from civilization. It feels like the air is so clean up there. But, yeah, it's – I I mean, I, I think you got the most out of your experience, Abe. Like, you just – um I just think you need to plan for enough days up there. You know, I, I killed mine on the seventh or eighth day of hunting. And so, you know, I just had more time to kind of find the pulse of caribou or to wait and – for a pulse to come through and so like i just think more days up there but man it is an awesome experience so you know us as hunters like i I think each different species we hunt in each new habitat improves our skill set in different ways and those caribou definitely improve my skill set but like you i just like to take in that whole experience of the arctic and the north slope and it it's so drastically different from everything that i'm used to or or you know there's similarities as far as open plains and the tundra but it it is just a different place and a different experience different temperature it's it's light all day it, it it's just like soaking that all up it, it's totally worth it for me if i if i never kill another caribou up there i'll still continue back and the excitement and the thrill of being able to stalk these animals and i love caribou meat but there's just there there's something about those racks that they support on on a 350 pound body they have a 400 or 450 inch rack on some of those caribou that just kind of bounce and move and then in the velvet they're 40 percent heavier like man it's exciting hunting those things it's thrilling and and i like bow hunts that are action-packed like i like finding action i like you know for me the moose hunt um it wasn't as much fun it was like 10 days and you just spend a lot of time looking for your one opportunity where caribou hunting they're just built for bow hunting where every day you're running after a caribou bull or you know stalking a caribou caribou bull not always running but you know sometimes you're trying to close the dif- distance or cut them off but every day you're seeing bulls every day you're stalking bulls like like it's just action it's excitement it's thrill you're trying to get close it's challenging in that open terrain and so man i i just i love that experience up there and we'll return back for as many times as i can to to go hunt those caribou it just makes for a great archery hunt man it's pretty it's crazy to see them out there on that open tundra and how tall and how big those horns are it's like yeah you, you know at a distance it's like you see the horns a lot of times way before you see their bodies or like that's what's you know it's it's unreal the proportions like you're saying of antler to body size. yeah they're just these beautiful rack configurations and when do you get the time to hunt a 30 pointer or a 40 pointer you know they're just points everywhere they're such a a beautiful animal that that that's so well adapted to that tundra and it it's it's just so drastically different than anything else i've hunted or any other place that i've been and so yeah i'm like you man i just soak up the the experience and can't believe I'm there, you know, when it's happening and, and just try to hunt hard and kind of leave it all out on the tundra and, and try to chase those bulls around. But it, it sure is exciting and thrilling to look out there, you know, on our public land and, and see a giant 400 inch bull and, and think that you have a chance at them, you know, and, and to go out there and, and, and day after day 
to to embrace that challenge and and try to get a good arrow in one man i just have a blast doing it and i you know i've killed a couple decent bulls up there and they're definitely decent respectable bulls that i'm happy with but there is some giants out there you know it's like uh so, some some bulls that were they they'd throw you a parade if you killed one of those they like just um just out of this world like proportions like you say and so I get pretty fired up looking at them, seeing them, observing them, and then trying to move in close to them. And and uh, it 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 doesn't always come together or happen, but it's a really exciting hunt. Yeah, that's cool. Are you gonna go back every year? You think? Is it become a, gonna become a tradition yeah. for you, or is it just gonna be as yeah, time? Yeah, you know, I haven't made my decision yet if I'm gonna go up this year or not. Um, yeah, I mean, I I would like to do it every year. I think the cost, um, you know, it, they they doubled the price of a non-resident caribou tag a couple years ago, and so now a caribou tag is like seven hundred and fifty, I think, or maybe it's. I think it's six fifty, yeah, and then you got like, your one hundred and fifty dollar yeah. hunting license, or. Um, so, you right. know, you got 800 into your tag, I got 700 into my flight and then the fuel gets really expensive up there. So it is a blue collar, do it yourself adventure that I think everybody should embark on and I'll do it as many times as I can, but, it, but it is, you know, a, a couple thousand dollars to, to me and my family, you know, it, it's it, like, I have to plan for it and, and it may not be every year, maybe every other year, but I, I want to get up there as many times as I can. And I got a really good buddy in Fairbanks that. I enjoy hunting with up there. So, um, yeah, I guess I just got to put my head down and work hard and save my pennies and get up there as many times as I can. But what a great adventure. Yeah. It's not like you're not hunting other places too, right? And a lot of us are. So you got to kind of figure out, you know, balance it out. But, man, it's a place that uh, – there's a few hunts in Alaska that I – that I are on my bucket list to do for myself that I could do them once or twice or every – few years and be happy but man there's some that i would love to do every year you know what i mean and that's that 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 hunt or that you know caribou hunting in general is definitely one of them yes absolutely and such great meat too they eat so good in that early season I, i've heard people say they don't like them as much once they get into the rut that they run themselves down pretty ragged i guess you know that and that could be true for any species really um, but you know, I don't mind eating elk in the rut or mule deer in the rut and I haven't tried them in the rut, but I, I love that. That meat is so good. Um, so yeah, I brought the entire caribou home, um, you know, this year and we've been eating on it about through it, but, um, just really good meat up there too on that tundra. Those caribou, have, they, they have a good living up there. It, it's gotta be fairly harsh. You know, you go from the, the, the harsh winter and all the snow and brutal temps to the summertime and all the bugs and things, but uh, they seem to thrive up there. Yeah, for sure. Um, they Yeah, they do. Their numbers are stabilizing. I know there's a herd dynamic with those caribou. I don't, um, I don't know how much you've, you've heard about that or looked into that. I've, I've talked to a couple of biologists, and so I, you know, in talking to them, it sounds like there's kind of this ebb and flow on I don't know maybe a ten year or or more kind of um, you know the herd builds up and then and then the numbers decrease and and it's been on the decline uh, for the last several years I guess and I'm kind of new to you know the caribou hunting thing but kind of trying to pay attention to it but it sounds like that that herd's stabilizing um, which is good you know good for hunting good for good for the herd dynamic overall and for hunters you know that they'll be continued access so hopefully it's not a long term decline you know hopefully it's kind of still in this this ebb and flow but i guess caribou just in general are that way yeah have you yeah, heard much about that um yeah it's uh uh, the the herds are funny up there and it's a funny thing to track and um you know because i think a lot of the that that herd you know they can move over one river drainage and all of a sudden it looks like your herd's declining but you just had you know ten thousand animals move over to the herd you know the the river drainage next door you know so i i think those right. herds are, are mingling a lot and and changing but yeah it is something that we definitely need to pay attention to as as you you want to sustain sustain sustainable resource you know for those those caribou and and you want the species to to do good it it seems like that herd's doing okay and stabilizing like you say but i have seen that that it is on the decline the other thing that we're up against too is um is is taking that hunt away altogether 
Yeah. Really? Are they talking yep. about that? Um, yeah, there's been talks. Um, so, gosh, I should have read up on it before we recorded this podcast. But, yeah, they um, – so they wanted to turn it into a subsistence hunt um, mm-hmm. for the for the, the – uh, for the natives up there, so they would turn that whole hunt into a subsistence hunt and take away the archery hunting and the 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 rifle hunting and take away that tag altogether. And it's voted behind closed doors by this this sustainable this council. And uh, I guess it was just one vote away or a couple votes away from being taken away from us altogether. So it's something we definitely need to pay attention to. I need to read up. I should have read up before we did this podcast. But it's something that we all need to be aware of that that they don't have a meeting behind closed doors and take that hunt away because it's such a great opportunity, you know, not only for us guys to travel from the States and go experience something new, but for, for you locals, like you say, the cheapest av gas you could find was 2,500. There just aren't that many opportunities up there for you guys to, you know, there isn't a bunch of infrastructure, a bunch of roads where you can get around. And so to have a place where you have 500 miles of haul road that you can go up and hunt out of your pickup truck and you don't have to pay $2,500 to shoot a caribou, and 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 you can get some good meat for your family like that's a great opportunity that that we got to continue to protect up there yeah for sure and just just access you know in alaska whether it's residents or or non-resident hunters coming up to hunt alaska for the first time or the you know their 20th time i mean just having access um to our public land and to a resource that's there um to have these experiences man i mean it's like you know i know we're we're kind of on the same page here. It's like, that's what gets me up and going, you know, that's what gets me excited about life and, uh, is, is hunting opportunities and getting out and just kind of seeing all these wild places and chasing wild critters and having these experiences that I'll remember, you know, kind of to my dying day, you know, I mean, that's what, that's what life is about for me. That's what I've kind of chosen to follow in life. And, and I feel like having like this hunt is a, is for me is kind of the epitome of, uh, accessible adventure, in, you know, in the Arctic in, or in a wild Alaskan place where a blue collar guy um, or gal who can squirrel away a couple thousand bucks, whether they're a resident or non-resident, that's just as a quick aside, a lot of people don't realize that residents up here, it's not, we don't have it any better other than tag prices. We pay the same, the same, you know, travel expenses, air taxes, it's all the same price as a non-resident. So um, the only advantage we have is just uh, cheaper tag prices. But uh, anyway, just the accessibility to all that public land, all that land's public. I mean, you got both sides of the Hall Road from the Brooks Range all the way to Prudhoe Bay. And um, that is a ton of country that is open to wander and adventure and hunt and recreate, you know, however you choose. And it's such a, I don't know, to me, it's like such a treasure, like such a rich thing that we have access to. And if that caribou hunt were to go away, that would be a, that would be a sad day oh, for man. sure. Well, and I, I know you made some connections up there while you were up there and talked to some, some people and biologists. But just putting yourself in that ev- environment, it's funny the opportunities that you come across. Uh, you know, we were hunting one spot where there was an outfitter camp in and they had a couple planes there. And pretty soon you get chatting with those guys and then they say, well, you know, we can fly into a spot, you know, and you could pick up an, a, a flight pretty easy and, and they would just fly in because they're already up there running their, their camp in. And their outfitters in so i've got that guy's number that i got a hold of where you could you could get a fairly cheap flight and not fly too far off the hall road he's already got his plane on the hall road like you could figure out some logistics there that would really help out i met another guy jeff right there where we were camping at that boat launch in there and he was taking his um a, what like a a, a wind powered boat um and and he was taking guys up and and he wasn't really running an outfitting camp he was kind of just like almost like a drop off but then he would run you way up the rib dawn where you could rifle hunt up there and run you up to a camp and and then be able to he'd move you around to different spots if you weren't in the caribou and and he was really knowledgeable about caribou hunting and and so i have his number as well you know where he'd run you up the river for you know a few hundred bucks you could get a totally different experience you know so being up there and making those connections it it's kind of um you you, you kind of open up the possibilities when you just start meeting people up there and you, you know you kind of find out different ways that you could go about it too 
Yeah, definitely. The um, I think the guys that you that you just kind of mentioned that I talked to, I think I was telling you about that when we met. They were doing a research project up there. Um, yeah. So just in case anybody listening to this is thinking about going up or is planning on going up, they have a deal where um, citizen science, you know, program where anybody who's up there for hunting or or just driving or whatever can download an app and record caribou sightings and log them in to the app and then it just uploads whenever you have service or wi-fi or anything like that and so they're using you know just kind of average people on the ground who are spending time up there to document that those herd dynamics and where they're seeing caribou and caribou numbers and stuff like that but uh i got the website if you want um it's uaf which is university of alaska fairbanks so uaf caribou project.com so yeah i don't know you can get it on there and take a look and i haven't been on there in a while but i downloaded the app while i was up there and uh and and track some you know recorded some of the caribou sightings i had and and uploaded them so they had some of that data but kind of a cool thing that they're doing and reaching out to average people and hunters and, and people just traveling up the hall road who want to help out with that project that's yeah, really cool i i wrote that down um are you able to access their information and their log in there like i said i haven't been on there in a while and honestly like we were talking before uh we kind of started recording but i just finished hunting season this week and that caribou hunt i went up there i think i left july 27th so i haven't really had much downtime since man then. you've been busy <laughs> you have a good guiding season <laughs> yeah i had a great guiding season man uh took some great animals met some very cool new uh clients who have become friends and uh all in all it was it was great squeezed in another caribou hunt went out to adak in october with a buddy um and actually we filmed that one so i'm going to be doing putting a film together for alaska diy that'll be out be out soon um so just a lot of fun but very very busy yeah so yeah that's that's guide life man it's like yeah i don't know you, what, is, what is this farming saying? You make hay while the sun shines. <laughs> That's it. Like that? um, yeah, you definitely yeah. keep really busy, but you're living life to the fullest. You, you got a, a beautiful family, and and uh, you, have, you love adventure and um, guiding really hard and trying to make your money for the year. I I think it's really cool. You're living the dream, Abe. It's fun, man. I tell you what, you know, it's crazy to think that like less than two years ago, I was working a corporate job and, and, uh, just the way life can change and, and change. Like for us, it took a lot of courage, even though a lot of people thought we were pretty foolish, mostly family, you know, who has our best interests in mind. They think we're kind of crazy for pulling up and, and chasing some crazy adventure. But man, I tell you what, it's been, it's a fun ride and we do. Yeah. Thanks for the comments on the family. We have a cool crew up here that we hang I like to hang out with my family there. They're a bunch of great people, and uh, man, we get after it. We have a lot of fun. It's uh, life's good, man. I just feel like, and and I know you know this, Brian, but when you start chasing what you love, man, life like there's rewards that go beyond, you know, you know, just your bank account and your 401k and and the feeling of stability. There's a lot of good stuff man, out there. So true. So we're gonna uh, try to put this out as a joint podcast. So for my audience, Abe, um, you've got your your own podcast. Where can people find that? Yeah. Okay. So I'm like iTunes, Stitcher, all the popular places. It's Alaska DIY. Um, and I'm going to have some, I'm <laughs> part of the, the guide life thing about being gone a lot is I haven't dropped very many podcasts this fall. So I'm, I've got a few in the pipeline here that I'm going to be dropping. Um, and then you can also get on, I got a website. Um, it's huntalaskadiy.com. It's got information, um, about, hunting in Alaska and I have some guides for sale, kind of how to guides on how to do specific hunts. And I'm actually going to do one here on uh, this haul road hunt in terms of just helping people with the logistics of, you know, if, if they've heard of the hunt or hear us talking and, and think that they want to do it, I'll have uh, kind of an in information guide on there on like just kind of the nitty gritty, how to plan the lo logistics, uh, things, things to do, things to consider that'll, that'll help you plan your trip and, and be more successful. Uh, so I got that. I got a Sika Blacktail guide up there. I'm going to do one for that ADAC hunt on um, ADAC Island, the caribou hunt there. And uh, so those will be available soon. The Sika Blacktail one is up there right now. Um, and then we got a film coming out for our ADAC hunt. Uh, we're, we're planning to release on March 5th with, uh, do you know Mike and Ness uh, from Silverline Films? Do you know those guys at all? No, Brian? I don't. I'm not familiar. 
based out of Boise, they're they're really cool guys. But Micah came out to ADEC with us and filmed that hunt for us. So it's kind of the first you know first film project that I've ever done. Uh, but uh, man, that was a really cool experience too. Had a lot of fun out there chasing caribou. So um, yeah, lots of lots to be excited about and look forward to. But yeah, people can can uh, find the website there at huntalaska.diy.com. And uh, then, of course, uh, Instagram and, and Facebook and the usual kind of stuff. It's Alaska DIY. Man, what a what a great resource you're putting together for people that are trying to plan an adventure in Alaska. Um, yeah, it's super, Abe. Um, you're you're always working hard. You're always grinding and and uh, putting out good stuff. So, um, man, really fun conversation. It was fun to break down that that haul road. You got me all excited about caribou again. Yeah, if you go back up again, you definitely reach out, man. I'd love to meet up with you again and and. Um, get to see you again and maybe do a little hunt together or at least grab a cup of coffee or something like that. But, uh, it's a cool place up there. I really want to take my boys up there. I, my oldest boy is 15 and then I have a 13 year old boy. And, uh, I'm kind of thinking about this year taking them up there and maybe trying to get my dad to come up from lower 48 to kind of have a family hunt up there and, and get to see that Arctic country and chase some caribou with, with boas and just have a good time. So for me, it's always time, you know, it's always like, like you said, the key a lot of times is having the, the enough time to put it together. But sometimes for me, I gotta just try to squeeze it in in the days I have available. So, but, uh, I want to get back. Up yeah, there for I sure. know how that goes. Well, yeah, um, sounds good. Uh, we'll we'll keep in touch, Abe, and and uh, yeah, next time I'm up there, I'll give you a shout and we'll hook up. But thanks a bunch for for being on the podcast and putting this whole thing together. Yeah, thanks so much, Brian. Thanks for having me on, man. All right, guys. Um, yeah, that's a a good conversation with Abe. I sure appreciate him being on. Um, it, it's fun to compare notes with somebody else that has a different experience of that that haul road. So um, I know Abe's got a, a, a ton of things going up there in Alaska. Make sure to check out his website, Alaska DIY, his podcast, Alaska DIY. And um, now he's got some some films too. He's just got a new film that just came out, ADAC. Um, it's really next level, level videography. Uh, make sure to check that out as well. And... Um, Thanks to, to Abe for being on and taking the time. I sure appreciate it. And uh, sponsor for today's show is Everly Stock. So I've been using their packs. Um, been falling in love with that Destroyer. That thing's been a great pack. I got that weight down right where I want it. Uh, packs the weight so well. Little Big Top, been using that for shorter hunts. I can get about five days worth of gear in there. And then that Kite Pack. I'm really liking that Kite Pack. And I've got some straps that go on the outside just a great day pack for four pounds and um, might even be less than that, but it, it just packs the weight really well. Um, it, it's small and compact. It, I, I like these packs that really compress to your back that you can hunt with too. And even the, the destroyers that way it's, it's big made for expedition style trips, but I can compress it all the way down and hunt with it. But uh, they make a great product. And thanks to those guys for sponsoring the podcast. Uh, make sure to check out the um, check out the Beyond the Grid. Um, if you don't have a subscription to Eastman's, text Elevated three one nine to two two eight two eight. And um, I think I got it all in there. Sometimes I I get done with these endings and go, God, oh man, dang it, I forgot to add in this part or forgot to to do this. So I gotta make sure I hit my checklist and hit all points. But the podcast is growing. I just can't thank you guys enough for the support. And uh, support on social media and the the reviews on iTunes help out. And, and just listening to the dang podcast, you know, that's, uh, you know, showing your support through the through uh, downloading and listening. I mean, that's the best way to show it. That's um, that's where we where we get our numbers and where we're able to continue to bring good content. So I sure appreciate it, guys. With this, this is the last podcast I have to get ready before I leave. So. Um, on a plane to New Zealand here. Um, so by the time this comes out, um, I'll be I'll be living somewhere way back in the back country. Um, it's just gonna be so awesome. Just a, what a a cool opportunity to be able to go to this distant place, you know, all the way across the world, southern hemisphere. It's their fall, our spring right now. Chase their mountain species, Himalayan tar and chamois. 
I mean, up in the most extreme mountain ranges, the the Southern Alps, you know, it's just crazy. It's just going to be absolutely breathtaking. And I, I like some of the dry, arid country they have. Just so many micro habitats there. The dry, arid country, chasing fallow deer. I really like those fallow deer. I like the way they look with the paddle up on top. And I'm not sure how big they are. I'm not sure if they're 150 or 350 pounds. I have no idea. But uh, I'm going to find out, hopefully. And uh, red deer, I mean, to be able to see those and hear the roar and, you know, they, they've got tempered rainforest there with ferns and, and old growth and things. So I just can't wait to, to go experience it. I'm going to try to take a million pictures to share with you guys. And um, I'm just going to go have fun. I've got all my work done. All this podcast stuff is done. I've got everything lined up. Um, family ready. Like, gosh, dang it. I'm just... um. I'm free for a couple weeks to just go uh, go walk around the mountains and wear myself out, live out of a backpack. That's going to be so much fun. And um, yeah, I, I've already fallen in love with New Zealand and I've never even been close there. I've never even stepped foot, but I just, I just can't wait to see it. So uh, I'm rambling on. I'm thinking about my New Zealand trip, which I've been doing nonstop lately. My wife is so tar- tired of me talking about New Zealand and the logistics and the plan. I mean, I just can't shut up about it. So, um, But I'm going to shut up about it now and hop on a plane and go do it for real. So uh, thanks a bunch, guys. Um, sure appreciate the support. We'll talk soon.